Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. In education, the Dairy Learning Annex has announced a brand new instructor joining this fall. Please welcome to the staff, Gert Kinshaw. She will be teaching her acclaimed self-defense class, The Fine Art of Six Great Ways to Fuck Up an Asshole. Sign me up. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And Benjamin Graham. What's up, constant readers? And today we are talking about Rose Matter, chapters one through four, if you're reading along with us. If not, spoilers for the book ahead. And CM is leading our discussion, so CM, take it away. Thanks, Josh. First, a before we get into the summary, I feel like we need a trigger warning. This book is about domestic violence, and I've read some interviews that indicate that there are many female fans who have read this book, and it has given them the courage that they need to leave their husbands if they're abusive, and I'm sure many others have read it and been a little bit traumatized by it, so just keep that in mind, and I can see why, because this book does not hold back. It is brutal. We open with Rose, our main character, a married woman sitting in the corner of her living room, having a miscarriage. This prologue is called Sinister Kisses because she feels something putting sinister, slippery little kisses against the insides of her thighs. Blood. Why is she sitting in the corner, losing her baby? I can't breathe. (laughs) (laughs) It's... The most intense beginning of a book I, I've ever read. It. Th- this is beyond any book we've covered. I, I'm kind of speechless. And, and we've we have covered some dark, dark stuff and some dark topics, but this I have never hated a character more than really. I fucking hate Norman Daniels. He makes George Stark and Harold Lauder look like Clark Kent and uh, fucking Peter Parker. Oh, God, yeah. He mm-hmm. is a goddamn monster. He is pure evil. He is what Todd Bowden grew up to be. Oh. Ugh. Oh, God, yeah, I see that. Uh, even Todd Bowden had an inner life. I feel like this guy, he's just an empty shell yeah. of oh, yeah. malice and fucking nothing. And who is Norman Daniels? Norman Daniels is Rosie Daniels' abusive husband. Uh, and but wait, cop there's more. Because <laughs> yeah. fucking of course. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. It's so hard to process this beginning. I feel like we could spend the entire episode just on this, the this very beginning. Because um, not only is she, is Rosie cowering in the corner of a room it actually she says that she's drowning in her living room because she cannot get any air and norman to show you so quickly how mundane this is to norman he has done this awful thing to her he punches her three times in the stomach and then proceeds to whistle around the house uh, as he casually cleans and makes himself a sandwich in the most dismissive, arrogant, monstrous behavior. It's so dark. He's just done one of the worst things a human being can do. And he feels nothing. It's so just as casual as if he would have turned off the tv like oh yeah i I beat my wife so hard that she is bleeding on the carpet and uh he just knows he'll get away with it because he is a cop and knows the angles to play and this all occurred because he came home and she was reading a book called 
Misery's Journey, shout out to Annie Wilkes, the brains behind Paul Sheldon. Oh, oh my God. Right, guys? <laughs> no, That's how no, I remember Misery. No. <laughs> Sam, this is... Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, he decided that that wasn't appropriate for her to read. He j- rips the book well, out of her hands and punches her. Th- that's the reason he gives. Right. That's not an actual yes. reason. Yeah. I'm just saying that's, mm-hmm. yeah. It, I, no, I just think that's a fascinating part of this character is he always has these reasons in his own head for why he does these fucking awful things, but they're not real. They're yeah. no just yeah. uh, excuses that he gives himself. And she knows this. Mm-hmm. Like when that happens, she says, I could have been doing anything. And this would have happened. This is something I wanted to bring up and ask you guys about. We, we've immediately you want to talk about Norman because he's the monster in the room. He's he takes up so much. He looms so large. But I want to talk about Rosie, our protagonist. From the beginning, she's she's cowering and she's scared. And this horrible thing. But immediately I I love her. Because even when she's in this position of this horrible position that she's in. She doesn't talk. She doesn't really do anything. She just cowers. But the way she's written, the way she, she is so, how do I, how do I, how do you describe Rosie in this opening? Because she's so powerful inside her own mind. Right. I I feel like she's so self-contained because she's in this horrible position. She has to live her whole life inside her own head. You see a strength in her that I don't think would be apparent to anyone kind of on the outside observing her in the situation that she's in. But yeah, you get just from some of the things that she thinks. She won't even allow herself to acknowledge some of these thoughts. But she looks at him and she just like in her head, she's like, I fucking hate you. And you can feel the just absolutely fucking awesome woman Mm -hmm. that she we get to know throughout yeah. the rest of the book. It's really interesting. I didn't it didn't click until you just brought that up that usually in a scene like this and maybe it's also because this is the opening of the book. Mm-hmm. In a scene like this, you a part of you wants that um that that Deus Ex Machina, that white knight hero to ride in and and like stop the bad thing that's happening in any way shape or form that they can, but because of the way Rosie's presented, I immediately I, I didn't realize I immediately did not want that for her. And I wanted for her to have the strength to take care of it herself and to leave on her own as opposed to someone rescuing her from the situation. Uh, because you can feel that that drive in her. You feel that strength within, within her that she's another part of her brain is just burying so she's having these thoughts. Norman decides to finally call the police. He calls 911 after taking his sweet time. He puts on a show. He's upset. You know, my, my wife is pregnant. Please get here. And then he comes in to assess the situation and see where he needs to stage the scene of the accident, which is Rosie having fallen down the stairs. And I thought that the duality in which she describes him was interesting because she talks about him being handsome, successful, with opaque eyes and moving towards her from across the room like a bull. And she continues to describe him and their relationship. We don't get any sense of what we generally think of as a cycle of abuse. The, oh baby, I'm sorry, I love you so much, it'll never happen again. And then he does it again. And he is so detached and cold it makes what happened to her which was already horrible a thousand times worse somehow there are so many stories i would feel that would try to paint him in that light of the oh he did this horrible thing and then he comes over and says i'm so sorry like you know being apologetic trying to gain her but there is none of that he does not give a shit about rosie no, and what does well, he do instead? He does he does apologize. He specifically says, "Sorry, stuff's been happening." Cuz he's having a hard time at work. And it's said in such a calm, dismissive like, "You understand. Like this is nothing. What I just did to you, nothing personal. It's just I've had a lot going on and this you you just you did this." And it fucked me up 
so hard. I am listening to this via audiobook and having to hear the voice actor doing this conversation. I uh, like, I don't think I could listen so, to this book. It was so intense. It was frightening and I had to stop. I had to remove myself from the story before I could come back to it. I don't think I could do that either because it hurt me physically just to bring us in with that opening. There are a lot of parts of this book that literally, I same, it, it mm-hmm. caused me to feel physically sick. Mm-hmm. There yes. are not many books. I can count on one hand the number of books that have made me physically ill reading them and this it, this joins that list and there's a duality in that too because as you're reading this and it's making you feel things very visceral things the writing is gorgeous it's so good it's astounding how good the writing is the as she's at the beginning as she is um like just laying on the floor in the fetal position she describes uh, she, as she's she can't breathe. She says, "quote There's no air in the air she is breathing," and it's just such a powerful way. It, it's a panic attack. It's I. Yeah. It's a feeling I know very well as someone with uh, anxiety problems. I felt every. I mean, I can't imagine the pain that she's going through, but like having that specific sensation Mm -hmm. described is so powerful. So Norman coaches her on what she needs to do when the paramedics arrive. And she just has to close her eyes against it all because she doesn't want them to see something in her eyes. I have a question for you guys coming into this. I had never read this book. Uh, Obviously uh, CM has is the only one that has. Yep. Uh, I mean, she's the one with the tattoo, <laughs> um, but I had no idea what to expect from this book. And there are a few things in this opening, in this prologue that made me think we were going to get something supernatural a lot sooner than we do. Josh, did you think she was going to be telepathic? No, there are several instances where, um, as, Norman is wandering around and fixing things. She feels as though he can, she can read his mind and that he can read her mind back. Uh, she says the reason she forces down, she won't allow herself to acknowledge the thought that she hates him is because she thinks he'll hear it. But you know what that is? Oh, it's abusive relationship. Yes. Yeah. He's gotten so far inside of her head that. But it's interesting because it's not just him. In the sequence where the the ambulance comes, she shuts her eyes uh, because, quote, she closed her eyes, not wanting to give them any opportunity to, to look into her. And she makes the voices come from far away, which I thought I, I took it a little more literally than, <laughs> it, than it's meant to be. But it's uh, it's very uh, very evocative, right? Very yeah. interesting. And yeah. I did think she was going to be telepathic. Uh, <laughs> I would have gone for that. It would have been great. Right? <laughs> so the prologue ends telling us that Rose slept within her husband's madness for nine more years, which, Fuck. as again, we all know about domestic abuse, not necessarily surprising. But when I read this, even though I've read it at least twice before, I try to shut off my brain when I'm rereading for a podcast so everything's sure. kind mm. of fresh. I thought that the prologue was going to be the final straw. Yes. So in thinking that, when I read that she stayed nine more years, my heart broke a little bit. Yes, 100. That's such a dark way to end this in this chapter. Yeah. It's showing this unbelievably terrible thing and then finding out this isn't even the worst of it. This is just another day is astounding. Before we we go further than this prologue, I want to ask you, CM, how how different was this reading it now? Because you were how old when you read this the first time? It was the summer before eighth grade. So 13, 14. Yeah. And how how different is that now reading this all these years later? 
Because I, I know the things that I read when I was younger, there's like a disconnect. Oh, yeah. I, I it, Reading this as a child, I would not have gotten it. Yeah. I would have been like, oh, that's bad. This was my first Stephen King book, which I've, I think I mentioned that in our very first episode. Yeah. And I loved it immediately. It was very compelling. But as I said, I was 13 or 14. I was like very slow to the game. I was <laughs> not, I was terrified of boys <laughs> until I was about 19 years old. So I had absolutely zero frame of res- reference for any of what Rose is going through for any of that relationship type stuff. And, especially for um, being pregnant and losing a child. And reading this now, I cried with her, for her, yeah, for yeah. all women. I I have been in a relationship since then that's given me some perspective on what she's experiencing. And the way that it hit me, Unexpectedly, even though I remembered, okay, her husband's an abusive psychopath, was alarming and difficult. It's so fucking terrible. I love it, though, yeah, because <laughs> I love nothing more than a Stephen King book making me feel. <laughs> okay, so something happens to Rose in this first chapter, something that wakes her up. She sees a drop of blood on the bed sheets. Norman had punched her in the face the night before for spilling a little bit of tea on him as she was refilling his glass. And the way she describes it, it wasn't, oh, you dumb bitch punch. It was just boom, like reflex. Like she messed up. He put her in her place. End of story. And the way that she describes a drop of blood, Ben, you read a quote earlier. I'm going to read a quote again because it's just so elegant. She startles herself by saying the words out loud. If this goes on, he'll kill me. She supposed it was the drop of blood, the little bit of herself that was already dead, that had crept out of her nose and died on the sheet. That's what she thought she was talking to. And then she has another thought on the heels of that one. And it's, except he might not. Have you thought of that? He might not. Okay, this freaked me out because at first I thought, okay, she's justifying it. She's like, oh, you know, maybe he won't kill you. No, No. she's thought about him killing her a lot. And what she's considering now is the possibility that she is going to continue to live through this another year, um, another 14 years. It would be worse to her to not die. That is how terrible her life under Norman is. Let's talk briefly. And I say briefly because I don't want to cry on the podcast (laughs) about Rose's life with Norman. So (sighs) They've been married 14 years. She has never been with anyone else. They married young. And everything started on their wedding night when he... He fucking bit her. Because she slammed a door. Because he was probably being a dick about mm-hmm. something. <laughs> and and he slammed the door to Norman's degree. Like, as far as we... She might not have slammed she it even. Very easily could have just shut a door. Yeah. Uh, and he... Fucking yeah. bit her. Liter- oh, there, um, I'm not as as uh, fastidious at taking notes as you two are. Uh, in fact, this is the first book in like three or four books that I've actually bought and <laughs> taken notes. <laughs> um, I was really good in the prologue. And as it went on, as we got into the first chapter, barely anything. Because I would start reading and just forget. <laughs> That's how much, oh. how sucked into the book I got. And for this part of the the only note I wrote down was, he bit her on their wedding night. What the entire fuck? Like, that's <laughs> all I had. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great note. And, and that's not the only thing. So I have a laundry list of things that he's done to her over the years. Just things that she has, you know, admitted while we're with her in this book. One miscarriage, one scratched lung. And this is how she describes it. This is not me paraphrasing. The horrible thing he'd done with the tennis racket. Oh, I oh, forgot yeah. that he mentioned that. that er- I, did, yeah, early I, didn't, I forgot too. Because it's that what comes you think up it is. later. Yeah. Mm. Um, the marks under her clothes because he doesn't hit her face because that causes trouble. Or he tries not to, but sometimes he loses his temper even more somehow. God. And mostly bite marks. She starts to feel a pins and needles sensation. 
and the book tells us that she doesn't recognize this feeling for what it is, and it is the sensation of waking up. I love this. Her slowly coming, yeah, awake for the first time. She describes 14 years of her life as being a bad dream. And just so suddenly, she's like, oh, fuck this. And immediately I'm like, yes, (laughs) yes, this rules. (laughs) Which is immediately followed by practical sensible, which the fact that she calls that part Mm -hmm. of her brain practical sensible is telling her to backpedal. I'm like, no, 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 leaving, leaving is scary. Just stay here and where you know what existence is. If you leave, you aren't safe. Practical Sensible is such a cool, uh, cool thing. It's it's a voice in her head, but it's so real to her because it's a survival mechanism that she has developed all of these years. And it, it really shows how, how strong her inner life is, like I said, that, that she's mentally as much as she doesn't know the outside world as we come to realize she is mentally so strong there's something i want to say here so badly but i'm oh it comes scared that it's going to (laughs) it's spoilerific (sighs) yeah okay so there's there's another voice in her head there are two voices there's Mm -hmm. practical sensible and then there's this deep voice born of rage that is telling her get out now and i feel like there's Rose, and then there's these two voices trying to get her to leave or to stay. I love that she she considers the all right, I'm gonna go, uh, but I'm in like and my hair's a mess. I'm in pajamas, like whatever. And she's like, okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll brush my hair. I'll I'll get ready. I'll pack a bag. But she that other part of her brain realizes that if she wastes any more time that voice will overtake her and she will talk herself out of it before she even gets to the door. So if she's going to go, she has to go right now. Mm -hmm. And she does something which made me cheer inside my own head. (laughs) She, all she does is grab her purse and his credit card, which is going to come back. Mm -hmm. And she walks out her front door. And she, she, it's practical sensible is like screaming, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> You're taking his money. His, oh, he's good. And it's, this voice in her head says, he'll kill you. And her, her, Rosie, Rosie Real, says, yeah, he'll kill me, but he's going to have to fucking catch me first. <laughs> and that was the point where I wrote, I love her. That was the point where I'm like, oh, this woman is an absolute badass. Let's talk about the journey from her front door because she is definitely, battered as she is, a cop's wife. She pieces together as she's leaving. uh, My God, my favorite thing when she first leaves the house, she gets to the end of the street and she can either turn left or turn right. And she says she she turned right because... Uh, of the things that she's learned from Norman that cops know you're never truly making a random decision. You always follow your dominant hand subconsciously. And she <laughs> says, so I turned right. Cause I don't want him to be right about even that. And it's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Not letting, letting him be right. Just despite the, the specter of him is so cool. <laughs> this, her walk down the street you can feel the agony that she feels. If you've ever been in any sort of uncomfortable situation, it's so, I'm going to say this word again. I'm probably going to use it a lot during this book, Visceral. Mm. She has, she's mentioned that Norman is, he's, he's a psychopath, but he's a good cop in a sense because he is good at following his gut. And he has this innate sense of knowing when something is going to go wrong when something's not right. And she is convincing herself that his instinct told him something's not right this morning. And he is on his way home from work, which would be down the path that she is currently walking on. (laughs) Damn it. Should have turned left. (laughs) That would have fixed this whole thing. Yeah. And as she sees cars, she thinks, Oh, that's 100% his car. This is him. And then it passes by and it's not even the same model. 
and it's Mm -hmm. not even exactly the same color, but every single noise she hears, she knows before she sees, she knows it's Norman and it never is. Thankfully, or else this book would be substantially shorter. (laughs) She's like a wild animal. She even has to relieve herself in someone's yard because she has like the, you know, when you get really nervous and you have to pee a thousand times. (laughs) Also, she has bad kidneys because Norman specifically targets her by punching her in the in the back and the sides because that won't leave marks. They'll just make her pee blood. Yeah. Ugh. Which doesn't bother her. But um, she's so used to it, which yeah, is insane. She, she describes peeing blood as, quote, just another unpleasant part of being married. Fuck. Fuck. No. It, for Fuck. anybody listening out there, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. If you think that, listeners, like, shoot us an email. We'll do fucking something. We're, we're here for you, man. That'll show up. I, I'll... <laughs> I'll do it. Crazy. <laughs> well, she so she walks for over two hours. Finally, calls a taxi, uh, and she finds out that she has walked over seven miles to get to where she ended up being picked up. Uh, she gets the cab driver to take her to an ATM on the way to the bus station. And I thought this was also interesting. She puts in his pin number, and she originally is only going to pull out seventy five dollars. Because that's enough to pay the cab fare and get the ticket and be gone. And she doesn't want to take any more of his money than she has to because he'll be mad. But then she's like, oh, he's going to be mad no matter how much I take. $350, please. Yeah. uh, And not enough. Still not enough. (laughs) Should have robbed that bastard. Right. Should have taken everything. It wouldn't have mattered if she took a dollar. He would still be furious. And then she gets to the bus station. And uh, is it? I think it's it's right here where she refers to herself now as Rosie McClendon because mm-hmm. she's decided that if she's left all of that behind, she's going to leave his name behind. And so now we meet Rosie McClendon for the first time. And she makes another cop's wife's choice about her destination. That was really interesting. The I, I made this note because I wanted to to bring it up to you guys. So she goes to buy a ticket, and she doesn't mention a city she just says a one-way ticket going what west yeah yeah going west at a certain time at a certain 11 time. something yeah eleven ten, i think yeah but she never says they never say what city she Chicago. went to is it Lake they Shore never city. they never say it it's a lakeshore no. city in the midwest they reference the midwest and it being there are a lot of hints, oh. but they never say yeah, they never, Chicago. They, no, I know I'm yeah. saying Chicago. That's, <laughs> yes, that's really no. Okay, well, the reason I asked is because I'm I'm curious: is that uh, for the mystery of it all, or is it because the destinations the, where she goes is not important? The fact that she's going is what's important. That's kind of what I figured. Is it, it definitely gives the story a more like this could be anyone, this could be anywhere kind of feeling. It gives Rosie this, um, (laughs) not every man, uh, every woman feeling. It also puts you in her headspace, too, because Mm -hmm. even though she knows her destination, she's lost. She knows nothing. And this is a really interesting and really terrible and real part of Rosie's story is that she knows nothing about the real world because the 14 years she was married you get the feeling she never left the house. Uh, if she did, she went to the market, and that was it. She was basically a prisoner, and she was never allowed to learn about the real world. So I, I can't even imagine how terrifying that must be to suddenly be like, I'm in a city where I know no one, I know nothing. Mm-hmm. Scary. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you feel what she's feeling. And it, it's just... It's a little touch. That's just so effective. And it's such a terrible, because that's, the isolation is part of that abuse. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's awful. She does something smart next. After she purchases her ticket, she throws the card in the trash bin because she's worried. Well, she's not worried. She knows that she'll be tempted to use it again. And he can definitely trace her if she does that. Which would be okay, except there's a, a man nearby. He's begging for change and he sees this and. Boy, is it his lucky day. <laughs> it would have been smarter to take it on the bus with her and dump it in 
the city that she gets to. Also true. Like, cut it up first. Nobody yeah. can use it. Yeah. But she doesn't know. Yeah, and this was like the 80s. Do they have scissors? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> As she's dozing on the bus, she has a dream. Did you guys notice that this dream is related to the painting that we haven't yet gotten yes. to? <laughs> I, I wrote because it's presented in such a way that it's it's just a dream. She's on the bus and she's not even really asleep. She's in that between uh, space when you're just on the verge of sleep. But she it says that she looks up into the sky and sees the huge array of stars and smells this grass uh, that she's laying in and hears crickets. And I wrote, I'm like, wait, wait, is this just a dream or is this something more? I thought it was just a dream. I didn't make any <laughs> notes on it. But now that you're saying it, I'm kicking myself for not picking up on it. <laughs> Rosie finally gets to her destination and she's in this Oof. huge terminal. It's not yet morning. And she wisely decides not to venture out until the sun comes up. Uh, real quick, can we touch on this is this is chapter two titled The Kindness of Strangers, and I in parentheses wrote, Jesus Christ, I hope this title isn't ironic. Like <laughs> I was good so yeah. scared that it was gonna be uh, an ironic, like, here's where bad stuff starts happening. And now her God, life really gets hard. Yeah, and I, I was so happy when it turned out to, for the most part, actually be genuine. Yeah. Rosie is disoriented and she's scared. And she ends up going to the Traveler's Aid booth where she meets Peter Slowick. Uh, God bless Peter Slowick. I loved him immediately as well. Yeah. Um, he is an older, uh, an older gentleman. He's reading a, what is it, a Russian newspaper, uh, Pravda, I think yes, it's so yeah. called. <laughs> And he's working at the Traveler's Aid Station, and he's the first person to – She she's so scared that he's going to be like, fuck off. Uh, I don't owe you anything. Yeah, she begs that he has kind eyes when he looks up, and he does. And he does, and it warmed my heart. Like, immediately, <laughs> I was like, okay, I, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what he's looking for. He has seen – this woman standing before him many, many times. Mm -hmm. And he ends up giving her a card. He tells her to go to Daughters and Sisters. It's a woman's shelter. He writes his name across the back of the card. And then he gives her the worst directions in history. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, as she was making her way through, I was also confused. I was like, why didn't they... Why didn't they write them down? Like, I couldn't have followed yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, no, definitely. I, 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 I like thought, I was like... Have phones ruined my brain? That yes. much? Because yeah. I, there is no chance in hell I could ever find my way via someone just being like, "Oh yeah, go down this street ten miles and turn left." I this, could not do it <laughs> because of this. We get what is arguably my favorite thing uh, in the audiobook, which is when she passes by. The, and this <laughs> is like early in the morning. Mm -hmm. She passes by a bar and there's a it dude who's 6:30 a.m. 6:30. There's a dude who's already drunk and as she walks by uh, I'm going to do my best impression of the woman doing the audiobook. Hey, baby, baby, you, you, you go over here, baby. You, good. Hey, baby, you want to baby, baby? What a fun take on a near sexual assault. <laughs> because that part I didn't enjoy nearly as much it was, reading it. Uh like to, oh man, the the woman who does the audiobook is amazing it's outstanding and there's something here she has a thought i think about, <laughs> about him talking she to her up close. thinks about thoughts yes okay, hey. she so it's at this moment when she's passing this guy she you know her experience of men is not good and it's something we didn't really touch on initially but it's going to come up again so we need to talk about it norman has his own catchphrase he sure does and it sucks it is i want to talk to you up close and that is, oh, that's the, the which is a super signal. menacing thing to say. It really is. Once. And uh, the tenth time I read it, I was like, okay, I fucking get it, Norman. Stop being a dork. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> fucking nerd with your catchphrase. <laughs> I, you, you guys know how I feel about repeated catchphrases. <laughs> it's, it once, it's like menacing. 
twice, it's like, okay, that's like a moment. Four plus times, it's like, you need a writer, man. Come on. (laughs) She gets lost and she is wandering around for hours. She runs into a few other strangers. I don't think they're worth mentioning. Some are cruel, some are kind. And she eventually finds her way to Daughters and Sisters, where she meets the shelter's director, Anna Stevenson. This scene made me cry. You guys, I cried. I laid in bed and I cried, and then I couldn't fall asleep for like another hour because I I felt so bad. (laughs) I also, um, I wrote, I am crying several times because Anna, the good characters in this book are so good. They're so kind and caring. And that's a weak spot for me. The (laughs) people showing honest, sincere caring for other people chokes me up. And the whole time that Anna is is going through the whole thing about daughters and sisters, Miss Practical Sensible is chattering away in Rosie's head, telling her awful things. The thing that's amazing here is that you get the clear impression that Rosie thinks that what she has gone through is a unique one of a kind experience because she has no other frame of reference. So she is so terrified to Anna interviews her before she lets her in the house and is asking her these questions. And that voice in her head is basically saying like, they're going to turn you away. You're going to have to go back to where you came from with your tail between your legs, whatever. Mm -hmm. And she expects a reaction from these people and she gets the exact opposite because this is, uh, this is a standard tale for them. These, this is just like Peter Sloak. This is something Mm -hmm. he's, they've seen time and time again. And the fact that she's so shocked that they're like, yes, we'll take you in. We, we will help you through this blows her mind. And Anna, Anna Stevenson is so patient And so understanding immediately their relationship. I was so invested in, uh, in this woman. And so oddly, I was grateful for this fictional character. I wrote Anna's a good, uh, good person. Please, please let this woman be kind. And when she was, I was like, thank, thank God that this woman is here. You are really on this journey with Rosie. Yes. Anna says that they have a room, which is awesome. But then she starts to ask Rosie about her skills because part of what they're going to do is help her find a job because they want her to eventually be self-sufficient. And there are always women who need to stay at Daughters and Sisters. So she asks her, you know, what kind of skills she has. Does she have secretarial skills? No. Waitressing skills? No. She, you know, has been beaten in the back for 14 years. She can't hold up a tray. She's been locked up her whole adult life, basically. And she, this is the part that I, where I broke down because she says, not unkindly, asks her if she has any skills at all. And Rosie gets angry again, finally. And she says, yes, indeed. I can dust. I can wash dishes. I can make beds. I can vacuum the floor. I can cook meals for two. I can sleep with my husband once a week and I can take a punch. That's another skill I have. Do you suppose any of the local gyms have openings for sparring partners? And I bawled. <laughs> oh, I oh man, I got hyped. Like with that, she like when she, she like fires that line at her. I was like, hell yeah, Rosie, get at her. <laughs> like let like she's letting that dam break, and yeah. all of it's coming out of her. And like, and now the, that rage is coming to the surface, and she can feel it. And, and the way that Anna responds, she just like smiles at her, and she's yeah. just like. No, you don't have to do that. It's okay. <laughs> she isn't like, hey, come on. I'm just trying to help. She's yeah. just there for her. She recognizes and that, that she needs that release. Yes. Yeah. It it killed me. Also, this might be weird, but did, did Anna Stevenson, um, did you guys picture her as a female Ron Swanson? Is that just me? <laughs> <laughs> ben, I don't know if I can picture a female <laughs> Ron Swanson. Uh, Not physically. No, her, her, no, name, that's where her, name, her name is April Ludgate. <laughs> uh, no, just like her, she's very serious. She's yeah. very intense. She doesn't, she's not super 
emotional outwardly later on when uh there's a point where uh rosie hugs her to thank her and she's like whoa hey no okay that's enough (laughs) and it just it just it reminded me of that like she cares so much but she's still very stoic and very um proud it's interesting because rosie kind of describes her as arrogant not in a bad bad way. way yeah um i was picturing murphy brown i love that too yeah Anyway, the the part that really got me, the the last part, Anna tells her, we will help you find a job. There's a hotel, the Whitestone, that we have a long relationship with, and I, you will work alongside one of our counselors. They will train you. We are going to help you get your life back. But she says there are three things that she wants to tell her before. I'm, I'm literally getting choked up right now <laughs> talking about it. Uh, she says there are these these three last things that she wants to tell her. And the first thing, uh, Rosie had said she she had alluded that she's a thief because she took this bank card. And Anna uh, says, first, taking the bank card doesn't make you a thief. That was your money as well as his. Second, there's nothing illegal about resuming your maiden name. It will belong to you your whole life. Third, you can be free if you want to. And literally immediately started bawling. That is such a powerful yeah. thing. That one sentence killed me. It's so it, good. A plus. It's just so <laughs> good. I, I love it. Uh, Rosie, as you said, Ben, gets a job cleaning hotels. She is partnered with Pam. And what's nice about her having this relationship with this counselor, Rosie has to kind of build up her health again to do this, you know, laborious work. And Pam is very understanding and it's not every woman for herself. She is with her every step of the way. Rosie starts her new life. Now we do something I hate. We switch to Norman's perspective. Uh, And boy, isn't that a treat. (laughs) I was so hoping that this whole story was from Rosie's perspective. I did not want to even fucking hear from this guy. I don't give a shit. I was so up, uh, like worried that it would try to do a thing that like, I feel like a lot of books would try to do of like trying to, if not humanize Norman, just like seeing his perspective yeah. would make him more human. And in King's defense, it doesn't. <laughs> nope, it There's sure doesn't. There's a reason for that, and I can't wait for you guys to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, liter- I can't wait to keep reading this Also, book. I, I will am- point out that, uh, again, in the audiobook, that it's uh, narrated by a female. The sections that are Norman, are, it switches narrators to a male. Oh, that's I'm going to have to cool. listen to the yeah, audio. Really cool. I highly recommend and it. It's again. so good. I am so disturbed by this scene, and I can't wait to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Josh, you had a question for me the other night, and we almost started talking about this book and had to stop ourselves. <laughs> because Norman is sitting on a bench. He's hundreds of miles away from Rosie. And I'm not going to call her his wife, because she is not. He's waiting for a young man, and there's some information he needs that that young man has, and he can do something in return for this guy. This guy's um, being brought up on drug charges. And in exchange for information... He can get him off. And I mean that (laughs) in multiple ways. Yeah, unfortunate turn of phrase. (laughs) And this scene, Josh, is where you asked me if Norman was gay. And this is where I had to really think about it. He is not gay because what he does to this guy is he rapes him. Yeah, Norman is nothing. Norman, I don't think he gives a shit about sex at all. He only cares about power. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, power, and, that's what power and pain. Yes. Yeah, that makes 100% sense. Do you want to describe? I sure do. Uh, I sure do. You're is, so excited I'm so it. excited about this. <laughs> this has been th- three weeks. Or, or she, Rosie's been gone for three weeks. And he's been working on this case in his spare time because he's working on a major case uh, at work. Uh, this guy that was arrested had Norman's ATM card. So he invites him over to the park bench for uh, a quick chat. Um, In one hand, he is squeezing a tennis ball, which I thought was very confusing. But I was (laughs) like, all right, whatever works. As they are sitting down and having a conversation about uh, what how how Norman can help him if if this guy can help 
him with something. He uh, recesses the guy on a park bench. Uh, yeah, he oh, just start. He puts his other hand in this drug dealer's lap and just starts massaging and rubbing his junk. And another thing that I I thought was really interesting for a moment. Once that happens, we jump into the the drug dealer's perspective, Ramon, and we get the backstory that he was molested growing up. So this like this to him is something that's so awful but in the position in his life he's just letting it happen because that's yeah, where his broken life is locked yeah it, it, it's victimizing a victim even more something that i find fascinating this whole conversation's happened while he's giving him a hand job in the park essentially and norman is going on and on about how um all the police officers are laughing at him he's angry Because other cops are laughing at Norman because you had my card and my wife is gone. He is so upset and it's so clear that it's for his own ego. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Ramon is easing into this process, you should you could say uh, Norman grabs him by the testicles and tells him he better tell him what he wants to know, because if he doesn't. And then in his other hand, he squeezes the tennis ball so hard it explodes. And he says, I can do that with my left hand, too. Fuck. (laughs) Fucking A. That was insanity. Uh, And it works. And it works. He's like, oh, yeah, I know everything. Yeah. Luckily, Ramon has the answers to the questions he wants. Depends on who (laughs) who that's lucky for. Yeah. It doesn't stop. Unlucky for Rosie. Lucky for his balls. Yeah. Well, it doesn't stop Norman from squeezing his balls so hard. He literally vomits all over himself from pain. And he starts to lose consciousness. And when he has all of the information he can get from this guy, he releases his grip just in time for some bystanders to walk by who noticed the guy. And it's, and he says, it's fine. I'm a cop and he's epileptic. <laughs> and then that's, that's Norman. That's our scene with Norman. Thank God that's over. So fast forward the following week and Rosie and Pam are cleaning. They have this tradition of going out for a cup of coffee afterwards, but Pam comes out and she doesn't look well. She's coming down with something, her period. She's sick. And she tells Rosie, go on, get a cup of coffee without me. Maybe you'll meet some somebody interesting. Rosie is not interested in meeting someone interesting. And she thinks to herself, besides, I'm married. Which is important because it leads to a train of thought that ultimately causes what we're now more clearly recognizing as PTSD. And she ends up walking a few blocks past her destination and finds herself near a pawn shop. And she goes inside. I uh, thought the pawn man. shop was cool. Just the way the pawn, shop's this pawn cool. shop is described. The first note I made, she talks about that. That's when, you know, she's going to pawn her engagement ring that she still has that she's been wearing. Uh, and Norman told her to turn the diamond inside. So people didn't see how expensive it was. Oh, it was that or a Buick and he yeah. decided to buy her the ring. Right. Instead. And the note I meant was he's convinced her the ring is expensive. I bet it's cheap as fuck. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> it's it a is. fake. It is. Uh, she meets Bill Steiner, who is uh, the son of the owner of the pawn shop, and he, the, he has to tell her that it's a fake diamond and that it the band is good. It might be worth as much as 200, but he'd only be able to give her 50 for it. And he's like, feels so bad that he like has he even says, don't worry, miss, you're in good company. As in, like, I, I've seen this a bunch of times. I'm I'm sorry to tell you, it's garbage. And Bill seems like a really nice guy. There's another guy in there, too. Robert? Uh, Robbie? Lef- Lefferts. Lefferts. Yes, Rob Lefferts. And he, it's this older guy. He's rifling through some used books. And he's kind of like the peanut gallery. He's interjecting here and there. So Rosie decides, you know what? I'm going to keep it in case I ever start to get weepy over a man again. I just have to pull this sucker out. And there goes <laughs> that feeling. And so she decides to leave. And she's walking out, and she is stopped dead in her tracks by something unexpected. An oil painting. The titular oil painting, Rose Matter. 
I want to talk about this for a second because it's been a source of criticism for this book. This book is not highly regarded. Uh, Many reviews like to point out various problems with it. And we've mentioned before how King can spend paragraphs, pages, entire chapters describing the way a piece of glass reflects the sunlight in an abandoned parking lot. And what people don't like about this is the vague description of this painting, which includes the observation that it's not even a good painting. (laughs) But I disagree with this because sometimes we've talked about this with horror movies. You finally get to see the monster Mm -hmm. and all the mystery and horror is sucked out in that moment because it's not nearly as crazy or terrifying as what your own imagination can conjure. And I think of this painting in the same way. And I think that King, whether he intended that to happen or not, this painting is like that. It's We know enough about it to visualize it in our own heads. Mm-hmm. And the important part isn't what an individual blade of grass looks like blowing yeah. gently yeah. in the breeze. The important part is what it does for Rosie. Yeah, and and I think that's just a crazy argument. Because, yes, the, the picture is described very kind of vaguely, but I have a crystal clear image of this painting in my head. Yeah. I, well, I couldn't draw it because I have no artistic (laughs) talent whatsoever, but I, I have an exact idea of what this picture, I think he does an amazing job of describing this painting. Also, what's interesting, I went ahead and uh, Google image searched Rose Matter paintings to see like all of the fan art And it's fairly consistent and some very, very good depictions that Um, almost matched what my brain. mm -hmm. We should uh, throw some of those up on the Instagram. Oh, yeah, we should definitely do that. But she decides this is the first thing that she should own for her her place when she finally gets one. The first thing that's just hers. And And it's almost supernatural the way that mm -hmm. it stops her, though. Yeah, she she says that like the the draw she feels to this, she justifies it in her head and just says, "Wow, I really like this painting." But she also says that she has no, she has no nothing to base this feeling off of because she's been so isolated her whole life. She just thinks it. Oh, wow, this is what a really good painting does. But it's described in a way that makes you go, "Okay, well, is that it or?" Is it something more, something deeper? Right, because she describes the way that it stops her. Mm -hmm. There are no thoughts in her head about the painting. She is stopped dead in her tracks before she even registers what she's looking at. It calls to her. She says it's almost like it sees her before she sees it. Right. So she trades her wedding ring for this painting, even Stephen. And something else pretty cool happens as Rosie is leaving the pawn shop. Yeah, she's confronted by Rob Leffert's book weirdo. Confronted. Hey, you know what? I no, I take I, issue with the words book weirdo. <laughs> that was my first instinct because the old man that was kind of giving her side eye inside the pawn shop comes out and says, ma'am, ma'am, please, um, can you read this? And he hands her this paperback book that he says just, he points out a, a, a short section, says just read it out loud to me. And she's like, uh, what? (laughs) She's really weirded out, but she does it. And as she's doing it, she finds that she's kind of a natural at it. And uh, it says, you know, she doesn't know because she's not worldly. But anyone uh, that knew a little bit more about the world would have known this for what it was, an audition. Which I love. And she goes back to uh, uh, daughters and sisters and says... I got a new job, which we don't find out what it is until um, until the next yeah. chapter. Yeah. And I she had also, a feeling that what it that it was what it yeah. was. And she also shows them the painting, and they all have this discussion around <laughs> it. And Anna even suggests where she could hang it. Um, we also meet two other characters. Yeah, uh, Cynthia. Uh, she's one of the new members of the house, and Gert shows up, and she teaches self defense classes. And there's a point where Rosie's like, I don't know if she is a counselor, if she used to live here. She just shows up sometimes and teaches women how to fight and defend themselves. And there's this really cool scene because Cynthia is so much smaller than she is. And she puts her in a position that basically she lets this small girl judo throw her across the room. So Cynthia feels like a 
fucking rock star and <laughs> yeah. it's so amazing i i love all of the women in the women's shelter and the only note i took unfortunately is as they're all gathered around to look at this painting it's so communal and they feel like a family close friends and i just wrote how will norman hurt these people oh well, god that's dark spoiler yeah. alert we run into cynthia again in desperation Yes, I thought so. That is her. Fuck yes, I thought. <laughs> I was like, she has these two-tone yeah. punk rock hair. And I'm like, isn't there a character in Desperation yep. that has that? So we know she survives. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so in a bit of foreshadowing, Anna talks to Rosie about um, her new place and the plan that she's going to have in case Norman shows up. Norman, we're back with him. He comes to Chicago and he... Or Well, I think it's Chicago. He comes to the city where Rosie mm-hmm. has fled to, and he has put himself inside of her head in order to track her down. And he's a good detective. I hate yeah, paying him yeah, a I mean, compliment. He, is, he, yeah, is he got a promotion cop. In, the, in the few weeks since we last saw him. He got a promotion. Yeah, he's, he's come uh, to the city because he's hunting Rosie. The, the important thing that I wanted to take away from talking about Norman yeah. is that we find out Norman's murdered people before he's a serial killer he's murdered he's strangled prostitutes that came out of fucking nowhere it's crazy and it's thrown off in such a like he's just like uh he he mentions that he's like oh the, nothing has mattered to the promotion didn't matter even the women he's been with since she left it hasn't mattered and i was like oh of course he's a womanizer right like fuck. Mm-hmm. and then he's like oh yeah it was a prostitute that he thought looked like Rose, and so he strangled her to death and threw her behind a fucking water tower or something. Yeah. And then once she was dead, funny enough, didn't look like Rose anymore. What the? So weird. <laughs> Norman realizes as he's walking around this terminal trying to be in Rosie's head that she would ask the traveler's aid guy for help. So he starts watching Peter, and he's watching his interactions with women, and he knows that this is the guy who has the information. So he leaves and he looks him up in the phone book. And there you have it. He's got his address, and I'm sure that Peter's going to be just fine. (sighs) Meanwhile, Rosie (sighs) has her second audition where she's at the actual studio. And I only mention this because it's important that we know that in her moment of self-doubt and panic, she calls on the woman in the painting. Something she's going to be... doing a lot of and something mm-hmm. i argue is that deep voice that was already inside her head when she first left yeah it is the painting actually speaking to her or is it just the totem that she is using to voice the strength that she already had i don't know you asked before if she was telepathic and maybe she has something because she goes home and she's putting away her groceries later that day And she notices something odd about the painting, and it is that it appears as if it has zoomed out, the perspective has gotten bigger, and she can see something that's always been there but is only just now revealed, and it's another god statue. That's so fucking cool. Because she's like, holds her hands up to it to measure it. Like, no, it's still the same, (laughs) but I see more. It's the same size, but it's bigger. Yeah. Which is very cool. So cool. (laughs) Then someone knocks at her door. And this is scary because even though like we assume that Norman is going after Peter, we know that he's going somewhere and all of a sudden there's this knock at her door. She doesn't have her phone installed yet, so she can't call 911. And in what I argue is something she would not do, she has forgotten to lock her door. So she grabs a can of fruit and makes her way there. So Rosie goes to the door with her weapon in hand. Peter opens his door, and who's standing there? It's Norman. Yeah, we cut to Norman staking out Peter's house and making sure that he lives alone. And immediately, he basically says, he's like, I'm not wearing a mask, but I don't need to. I No one, he, he's not going to be able to report yeah. me to the cops. It's really brutal. He, it's bad. He knocks on his door, and then he busts his way in and he's you know peter's like you've got the wrong guy he's like no i don't and he says says some 
real anti-Semitic shit. Oh, God, yeah. Because, oh, he's super racist Because, and of homophobic. course, he's racist and homophobic. Sure. And just the he worst wasn't already bad enough. In we had to every in. way possible, he's the just fact the that he, worst. His excuse for why he gets so unreasonably mad is that this guy's wearing a white man's undershirt. He, he's wearing like the same of kind yeah. of yeah. undershirt. And I, I know why that is, is because he's already made up his mind to kill this guy. Yeah. And when he opens the door, he is wearing the same undershirt that Norman wears. And for that brief second, that reminds him, oh, this guy's a human. Yeah, it's too This guy's a person. And it infuriates him. How dare this guy not be an animal that yeah. I can just slaughter? And so he takes him to the basement. I can't he, even. I can't. He ends up having to take him into the basement because even over the TV being cranked up full volume, the man's screams are too loud because Norman has started to bite. He comes up. He His mouth is covered in blood. He gets in the guy's shower, finds a shirt that'll fit him, and he leaves. And he says, he, like, I don't even know if this is going to do any good. I don't know how much evidence I left behind because, quote, kind of grayed out there for a while. Yeah. A That's terrifying. Teeth impression evidence, I'm sure. That's the scariest shit in the so world. So dark. And then we cut back to Rosie's. Yes, she opens the door, and there's Bill Steiner, and there's Rosie with the can raised <laughs> above her head, ready to brain him. And, and I love it. <laughs> and he, Bill just looks at him, or looks at her, holds up some flowers, and goes, truce? And immediately, <laughs> my note is, if these two don't have a happy ending, I'm killing myself. <laughs> and he, is, he is at her door, because Rosie left an impression on him, and... She almost leaves another, but realizes <laughs> it's him, not Norman. She puts down the fruit can, and he explains that he got her number from Robbie, and to his credit, Robbie was very reluctant to give her any, give him any information, so he did, did finally track her down, and he asks her out on a date, and she almost doesn't go with, but yeah. who does she think about again that really decides her? Every time she has these very founded fears, kind of, uh, she she thinks about the woman, uh, capital letters, the woman in the painting, who gives her that strength uh, because she says she wouldn't be afraid. And it gives her that strength to just say, fuck it and go for it and have what I think is a very cute date. It is a super cute date. A little oh, freaky because yeah, it's they, super go, weird. they go to the place that Norman passes on his way to kill yeah. Peter. The note I made was, fuck, dude, stop asking about Norman so much. That, too. I did. Bill, I was, the summary of their date is Bill's like, I met you. I'm obsessed with you. Tell me about your husband. He yeah. wants to make sure that she's not still sure, attached to but him. But he comes, he comes, he comes off on a little strong. Real strong. I, if this, yes, if this were a real date, it would be like, uh-oh, someone yeah. in this restaurant is t- tweeting about this uh, disaster. <laughs> but in this book, it it's... It's nice. I, I I like these two. Because he his thoughts about her are just so nice and gentle and wonderful. There's no creepiness other yeah. than him coming off a little too strong. Yeah. Well, he, he gets bonus points by just not being Norman. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, the bar has been set pretty low. <laughs> true. He takes her back home and walks her up to a door. She does ask him if he wants to come inside, but he... Good move, realizes not a good idea. I need to yeah. back off a little bit. And he kisses her on her forehead, which is really sweet. He asks her for another date that weekend. And, you know, he wants to take her on his bike, ride up to this beautiful, scenic place, have lunch. And she again hesitates, again calls on the strength of the painting and says, Yes, but on one condition. I'm helping with the daughters and sisters' summer concert and picnic. And so I have to get back in time for that. And I'll buy you a concert ticket. So they have their next date scheduled. And later that night, Rosie is in her home getting ready for bed and she notices something else about the painting. It's yet again, it is expanded. She can see more. She can see uh, a pony or yeah, a horse. The head of a pony. She thinks like, huh. I might be going crazy, <laughs> but she also thinks maybe Saturday when she has her date, maybe she will show it to Bill. See if he notices that it looks different. Mm-hmm. That night, she falls asleep to the sounds of crickets and thunder, which is odd because neither of those things are present. 
And that is where we end our part one. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode for part two, as we will be covering chapters five through seven. For Benjamin Graham and CM Alexander, I'm Joshua Khan reminding you, you can be free if you want to. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thanks for listening to Rose Matter Part 1. I'd like to read a poem. This is from a woman who experienced domestic violence for 14 years, much like our Rosie Real. I found this on familyfriendpoems.com. You took away my innocence, my hopes, my dreams, my youth. You took away my very soul. What could have been, I never knew. Your words would cut me deep inside, deep to the very core. Darkness, cold, I could not feel. Why did you hate me so? You crushed me as I screamed in pain. Your words ripped out my heart. The world grew dull. I felt insane. Did you ever care about that part? Is that what you wanted all along? I win, you lose, a game. Control, submission, guilt, defeat. Yet, I still remain. It was for a child that I lived, although I rather would have died. Now, how I thank God for that child. Because of her, I have survived. I will live in spite of you. You no longer have a say. My life, my body, my mind, my soul, you will never again have control. Whether in this world or in the next, justice will have a way. You hurt me and you almost won, but you lost, I have to say. A new dawn breaks of hope and peace, of happiness and grace. From me these things you cannot take. My head held high, I walk by faith. Rather than telling you where you can find us and asking you to rate and review all of that, I want to say if you are a man or a woman experiencing domestic violence, you are not alone. There are people and places that will help you. If you're in a small town with scant resources, one of those is the National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-7233, or go to hotline.org. You can also go to n cadv.org slash resources for additional information. If you are not personally experiencing domestic violence, but you want to help, take whatever you are thinking about donating to us and instead go to America's Best Charities, best-charities.org, and find an organization to donate to. Remember, you can be free if you want to, but no one expects you to do it alone. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye. Goodbye.